pleased tonight to introduce Richard K. Han and Mike Williams. Hi, everybody. Can, can you guys hear me in the back? OK, OK. So hello, Berkeley. This is becoming like a rock star tour. Wherever we go, um, people fill the halls to hear about Vivian Meyer. And um, very few people fall asleep. So I'm, I'm warning you. In Portland, a dog fell asleep in the first row. But, but, but we, we've gone six talks in a row, and nobody's fallen asleep. Um, I don't think it's because we talk so well. I think that everybody wants to see the pictures. Um, I asked people outside why they, were there, why they came here today. And the answer was always, Vivian. As if you need any, any, other, um, um, any other reason. Um, I assume that most, or is there anyone that doesn't know the Vivian story and is not familiar with her? Wow, that's pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, Mike and I are here to talk a little bit about her life and her legacy, and uh, we're interested in sharing her with you. We're interested in your feelings about her. We have an hour to talk, or close to an hour to talk. And um, I guess I'll start by just telling you, uh, we've thought a lot about what makes Vivian so special. And um, my feeling is this, that people are very familiar with her pictures. We've all seen the pictures that Vivian took because they were all pictures of everyday life. We just didn't have a camera. The pictures are so universal. We were talking to Ira Glass uh, a year and a half ago. He did a short documentary on Vivian, and he said something very interesting. He said that he was born and raised, he was raised in the, in the 60s. And he said the, the pictures that he sees of the 60s, the Selma March, the astronaut on the moon, the Vietnam War, he said, those aren't really my 60s. These are the years, these are the pictures that I relate to. And although the pictures are old, I don't think that nostalgia is a big part of the pictures. I think that there is a real connectiveness to the pictures that uh, give us a chance to feel like we're, we're walking the streets with Vivian. Um, I don't know if, her, if she would have shown her pictures in the 1950s or the 60s or 70s, if anyone would have appreciated them. We're now in an Instagram world where our lives seem to be interesting to everybody. And um, really what Vivian did more than anything else is she chronicled her own life. Um, I love being here because I believe that Vivian Meyer was a journalist. It's not the kind of journalism we teach in school. The last thing we teach, I went to journalism school, was to ever put an eye. We try to avoid talking about ourselves or thinking about ourselves or uh, you know, contemplating ourselves. Um, this was pretty much what she did. She took the camera out. She didn't have any great plans. She was off on Thursdays and Sundays were her days off and she would leave. She didn't tell people where she was going. A lot of people saw her with cameras and never expected that she ever took pictures. We talked to someone recently who, who knew her in her older age, and she, he was convinced that they were just fashion accessories. <laughs> um, everybody is surprised. Um, we had a chance to talk to about 30 people who she worked for. She took care of their children. She took care of their uh, elderly parents. And, um, and nobody had a hint of what was going on. And I think that they're disappointed. I think that they're disappointed in Vivian for not sharing her life with them. And I think they're really disappointed in themselves for not really taking the full measure of what she was all about. And I th there's, there's so many side stories here. Uh, but let me tell you that there's a moment in this whole process that people hear the great story and they say to themselves, this, she can't really be this good. It's a really great story, but she can't really be this good. And then they open up our book or other books, or they see movies about her, or they see a slideshow, and there's always this moment. She really was this good. <laughs> I've been a picture editor. Michael and I have been picture editors for our lives. We've seen a lot of photography and a lot of photographers. And you're not supposed to start a, a speech by, by hyperbole. But we've never seen work like this. Um, for every roll of film, and most of her rolls of film were just 12 shots, roll of flex, medium format, 
in almost every roll of film, there's something that we could put in a book or we could put on a wall in a museum. In fact, it's interesting. Um, there's a Vivian Meyer exhibit at the Chicago History Museum. I don't assume anyone has seen it. Have you, any of you Logans had a chance to see it? It's a couple of blocks from your parents' house. Um, it's, it's 40 life-size pictures that she took of Chicago, and it's all arranged in a maze. So you walk through this maze, and you, you feel exactly what Vivian was feeling. And we were very, very proud of this idea of showing photography full size. But then we had to figure out what to do with the walls. And somebody suggested to us, why don't you just show her contacts? It wasn't contact sh sheets, contact strips of 12. And it was really important that we showed those strips because everyone said to themselves, I don't know where the logic is, well, she took 100,000 pictures, so there's got to be 40 good pictures that we can put on the wall. As if now all of us have taken 100,000 pictures with our cameras and there's probably not 40 pictures. As much as people enjoyed seeing the big pictures and experiencing what Chicago was like, their jaw dropped when they saw these 18 contact strips. I remember when I was a young photographer, my goal this is a really kind of an obsessive, weird thing. My goal was to take the perfect contact strip. Did you ever have that goal? And I always kind of fudged out about shot number three. Um, she had perfect contact strips. That doesn't mean that every picture she took was perfect or great. But I will tell you that almost every picture she took was in focus. <laughs> well, no, uh, you're laughing, but that's pretty remarkable. I mean, this is, wait, wait, I should back up. There was no automatic focus during those years, okay? Okay? Um, I would, we never, w Michael and I in our books and our exhibits have never cropped Vivians. And we kind of boast about it, like, oh, we're such great people. We, we, we would never touch, we would never put our own stamp on the pictures. Here's the truth. We didn't have to crop any pictures. She had an uncanny ability uh, to compose pictures correctly. And let me back up for a second. Okay, we all take pictures now, we take a picture and we look at our camera before we take our next picture. Vivian went years never seeing what she had taken. She just couldn't keep up with the expense of processing her film. So her lens could have been broken in 1965 and she really wouldn't have ever learned about it until 1969. Um, so tonight, we want to tell you the story of Vivian. You've all heard it, but I think we can fill in details. Um, if people have a pressing question as we go, I think you can raise your hand. Let's try it, because if you have a question, probably everybody else will have a question. And we'll try to sort out a little bit the, the competing stories. They're not really competing stories, but, but the different stories about Vivian. So um, you want to show You're on a roll. Should, should I'm just going to sit here. I, I, I'm going to. I'm going to get. I'm going to. I'm going to talk for another five minutes, and then you're on. Okay. All right. I'll advance the right. slide for you. All right. So, how many of you are from Chicago? Oh wow! I think that's half the room. Okay, and I know why you left. Uh, if you're from Chicago, you probably have seen this apartment. It's on Sheridan Road as far north as you can go in Chicago, and you take the turn and you go, come into Evanston Northwestern University. So this is the very top of Chicago, and this is where Vivian lived, was living when she passed away. And um, um, she had taken care of three young boys called the Gensburg Boys in Highland Park, and, um, and she had been there for 16 years. This was from 1955 to 1971. And finally, the youngest of the Ginsburg boys was 16 years old, 17, 17 years old, and about to go to college. And so uh, Mrs. Ginsburg said, well, Vivian, maybe it's time that you look for another job. The kids are all in college. There's really no point of you working there. And the Ginsburg boys reconnected with Vivian around 2003, 2004, 2005. They love Vivian. Vivian was Mary Poppins to them. As Vivian got older, imagine Mary Poppins at 60. It's not the same as Mary Poppins at 25. Julie Andrews growing older. But they absolutely loved her. They reconnected with her. And they knew that she was destitute. And they paid for the apartment in this, in this building. Um, they also gave her a cell phone. Vivian never used it. So there was this very strange relationship. Uh, they knew when, uh, so Vivian fell 
on Howard Avenue in, in, on the ice and broke, uh, broke her hip and was taken to the hospital. And the Gensberg boys knew exactly that she loved the New York Times. They knew exactly what kind of uh, uh, yogurt she liked. And, her, and Mrs. Gensberg said, why don't you do this for me? Why don't you, you know? <laughs> so so it, it, can, it can run very deep roots. So Vivian passed away in 2009. In 2007, her, um, her estate, we'll call it, was sold at the RPN auction. It's an estate auction service on the northwest side of Chicago. Um, there, it was exactly like you see on TV. They, there was a, state, uh, a, a storage locker auction, and they lifted up the storage locker, and one man saw a trunk that had a decal from France, and he thought that was pretty interesting, and he bought the first unit for $50. Nobody else bid on it. And then they rolled up four others, and this man, he was on a roll. He, he bought them all for $250, okay? So in there were, she had not paid her rent, Vivian's clothes, Vivian's books, Vivian's newspapers, Vivian's cameras, and Vivian's negatives. Let me tell you, the negatives, and we talk about 100,000 negatives as really being a lot of negatives, which it is, but it's a tiny physical, there's a couple boxes of negatives. It really wasn't a very big part of the whole thing. Either way, he got a large truck, and he emptied all five lockers. He brought it back to the RPN sales, and he divided everything into 400 lots, and he sold the 400 lots for $10,000, and he thought he had made the deal of the century. <laughs> um, one person by the name of John Maloof, who lived about two blocks away from here, bought about 30,000 of the negatives. Uh, it was a uh, silent auction. He put $400 on it because he was doing a book about Chicago and he saw that they were, he looked at a couple of negatives, he saw they were from Chicago, so he, so he bid $400. He wasn't there when he, when he won. And two other people bought the rest of the negatives. Um, one of the men, Randy, bought 20,000 negatives and he sold it to Jeffrey. Where is Jeffrey here? Jeffrey is outside. He's probably listening to everywhere. He tells me later how I, how I screwed up. Um, he sold them to Jeffrey, and ultimately, John Maloof acquired about 100,000 Vivian negatives. Jeffrey has about 15 to 20,000 negatives and prints, and, and John Maloof has prints. And the movie that is now appearing, Finding Vivian Meyer, was directed by John, so it's his story. John thought that he had all of the negatives when he, uh, you know, when, when, when after he had acquired them, and then he was very surprised that other people had bought negatives too. Okay, all right, let's pick up the story. Okay. So I think the story Mike, picks yeah. up here for a lot of us. This was my first exposure to Vivian Meyer's work. Uh, it was John Maloof's blog, and he posted pictures, not, not too many at first. I think you got to wait. Oh, get away, away from, from the microphone. As long as you got yours. Not too many at first, but the ones that he posted really resonated, not just with Chicago and his friends, but the world. And it's really hard to imagine the phenomenon, this Vivian Meyer phenomenon we see today happening like 20 years ago, because this was really fueled by the internet. The pictures were posted on this blog. People would create links, they would email their friends, and literally almost overnight, this phenomenon just spread the world, like one of these apocalyptic viruses you hear about. And, um, and people started talking about it. What was really interesting about this phenomenon in the beginning is it wasn't really spreading among photo fans. Right. Photo fans were a big part of it, but it was among just people who were drawn both to her story and drawn to the work. And I think what really speaks to the universality of her work is that people across the world were drawn to it. It's pictures of kids, it's p pictures of lovers, it's these pictures that really, uh, they're timeless. They don't speak to America. They're not about America, they're not about Chicago. They're about human beings and feelings. So I think that for us, when we first saw these pictures posted as a, as a photo lover, I think a lot of us had these kinds of suspicions. Well, anybody can edit a group of photographs from a person's lifetime of work and find 50 great ones. So I think the story for us and for a lot of people was what else is there? And as we quickly found out after we went through Jeff's collection, it really was just the tip of the iceberg that the work was so good and so strong uh, that it has so many themes and so many wonderful pictures to it. One of, one of the interesting things, when John put the pictures on his blog site, it was a Flickr uh, discussion group on, on, on street, photographer, street photography. 
and he asked the question, and you can actually go to the site now, it's still there. He said, I've just acquired um, thousands of photographs from this photographer, I don't know anything about it, but he put in about 20 or 30 photographs, and he asked, what should I do with this material besides give it to you? That was the question. Well, within a couple of minutes, somebody uh, answered back, put them in an art museum. About 10 seconds later, somebody wrote back, whatever you do, don't put them in an art museum. <laughs> and that started a real interesting, not a dialogue, but so you might, you might wonder, why isn't Vivian's work in art museums? And I, I have a couple of, we, we have a couple of, of ideas. Uh, number one, she didn't leave a lot of vintage prints. There are, there are what's called vintage prints, but they're really almost, uh, they're, they're processed, drugstore process prints. There's not a lot of vintage prints. There's no signed vintage prints, so she didn't do it that way. She also didn't take the traditional ladders that photographers take in order to be in museums. Um, and finally, I think that museums were a little upset that they didn't discover her. <laughs> it was this guy in Chicago who put down $400 on negatives and now he's sharing them with the internet. You know, wh how do we deal with this? And, and this really opens up this whole new idea of photography and art and how you can touch the world and reach the world without going through museums. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a really good point because as Rich said, normally a photographer would not go from being totally unknown and within two or three years or even two or three months being a worldwide phenomenon. Most photographers would work small in galleries and get small shows and get into larger collections. In this case, it was really the people who decided that this is an artist and a photographer that we like and we want to see more of. It wasn't the curators and it wasn't the galleries. So I think in that way, uh, it's a very unique phenomenon. It's hard to imagine this happening uh, again in that right. way. Right, absolutely. Can you so move the cursor? It's oh. such a beautiful picture. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. And this is Vivian in Highland Park at the Ginsburg's house on the right-hand side. And people always come up to us and say, isn't it a shame that Vivian isn't here to appreciate this? The answer is she wouldn't let this happen. She was a very, very private person. And um, she never talked about her life. And I don't think that she would let this happen. So, of course, I hear your minds. You're saying, so should we do this? <laughs> and um, I don't have a definitive answer. Um, should Emily Dickinson's sister published her poems? Um, there's no real easy answer. Uh, we thought the work was so valuable and so worthwhile that it was worth several years of our lives to work on this. And obviously, there's no question in our minds now because of the response. But I don't think that Vivian would have let this happen. So. Well, I think you should, you, you should temper that a little bit. I don't think Vivian would be happy with the way her personal life has yeah. been kind yeah. of become open and fodder for speculation. But most of the people that we talk to who work for really feel that she would have been so proud of this. Yes. And it's fascinating watching people. We are, it turns out our distributor of the book actually had hired Vivian and was the nanny for, for his children for a few years. <laughs> so he was intensely curious and he was the first person really in the business to see, to see the book and to watch him and his wife go through page by page because they'd been wondering for years, what was she doing? What was she taking pictures of? They wouldn't, she would never allow them into this room where she kept things. And to watch their faces and the smiles on her face, this look of pride, this look of surprise, this look of you know, total just befuddlement. And I think in that way, I think that they were really so proud and both, both surprised and proud but ultimately, I think even they said to us that she would have wanted, she would have wanted her work to right. come out, but she would never in a million years have let kind of all this personal part of her life come out. And it is bewildering. Just imagine if you had a maid in your house in the 1950s, and, uh, or, uh, or somebody who took care of your kids in the 1970s. Phil Donahue uh, hired her for, her for his four sons. It didn't last very long. She started, <laughs> she, he saw her taking pictures of newspapers and garbage cans and thought that this just wasn't quite right. <laughs> Although, hearing about her, her, his four kids, I think she was the sanest of the group. Um, <laughs> but, um, but imagine that all of a sudden, this person who you really have never even sat down at a table with is now an international art star. <laughs> and, you know, and it's her personal life. 
we were, here's a little inside publishing, we were very, very careful not to show pictures of these families inside their homes generally. There was one or two pictures that we couldn't resist. <laughs> so we're open for lawsuits if there's a, uh, but, but, uh, but generally most of the pictures are taken out on the street uh, where, she, where she took a majority of her pictures. Can you talk about her politics? Vivian was a staunch feminist, liberal, um, um, difficult person who loved to talk about politics, loved to badger people, but didn't talk much about her own politics. The adjectives that most people use who knew Vivian, it comes up all the time when you ask, what was she like? The word is substantial. <laughs> she was substantial physically, and she was opinionated. Uh, she was not an easy person to be around. We talked to uh, the guys at Central Camera. Central Camera is a store just like those New York camera stores, real long and filled with old cameras. And um, one of the sales clerks said, whenever Vivian walked in the store, I went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's interesting, too, to your, to your question. Uh, one shopkeeper, Bindi Bitterman, who lives not too far from me, she said whenever Vivian came in, she would be trying to take a measure of her. She wanted to know about your politics. Right, right. She wanted to know if, if right. she was the type of, you were the type of person that she wanted to deal with, or that she wanted to give her business right. to. And she would ask very specific questions about politics and how you felt about issues. And in fact, in this store, she would purchase the most obscure 1930s journals about. Ken, Ken Magazine. That yeah. Was a, that was so, and you definitely see it in her pictures as well. Her politics are right there. She was deeply affected by Bobby Kennedy's death. She, made these little memorials to uh, political figures who died or that she liked. So it was definitely big on her mind, yeah. But she was, she was private to the extent of being secretive. Uh, the Matthews, who Mike just mentioned, our distributor, said that um, Vivian did tell them that she had lived in France. And um, the Matthews kind of thought about it and thought about Vivian's age. And so they said, well, you must have been in France during World War II. Um, were you part of the underground? And she said, maybe. <laughs> uh, one of the children we talked to talked about Vivian creating a play and assigning parts to all the kids in Highland Park. And so finally, um, this little girl said, well, Miss Vivian, what part are you going to play? And she said, I'm going to be the mystery woman. <laughs> so this was very, very important. Um, I think that when you see her pictures, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of her own personal life, but I think it's more of a reflection of what she was seeing. She was this incredible mirror of life around her. And, um, and I think that um, it's hard to see, you know, like Mike says about Bobby Kennedy, you, you have to look at all of them to understand the, you know, this isn't, this is certainly her personal journey, but it's a real reflection of the world around her. Maybe we should skip ahead a little. Okay. We're, we're skip okay. Ahead I think we're doing okay. We're, we're doing, doing, doing okay. okay. Seven fifteen, right, Ken? Okay. Yes. Can you talk yeah. about the equipment that she used? Okay. So Vivian used. Um, do you want to talk about that, or do you want me to? Sure. Okay. Uh, she used a thirty-five millimeter camera. Often she would shoot slides, but the magic happened when she used a Raleigh Flex, a twin lens reflex so camera. camera. This is like at. these old-fashioned cameras that have two lenses. One is for viewing, and one is for taking. And it's funny, sometimes she would wear two cameras around her neck and she would take pictures with both cameras. The pictures she took with the two and a quarter camera, they're magical. They're just, they transcend, you know, normal photographs. The pictures with the 35 millimeter, millimeter camera are pretty they're good. average. They're, they're okay. Good. They're good. But, they're but not, she had they're this unique special. relationship with the square format. That's something that was really special. And many critics. You know, there, there's an industry of putting Vivian down. Not so much anymore, but when she first came out, there was an industry of people who wanted to, f to, to figure out what was going on here. And, um, and, th and a lot of people said, well, she used a Roloflex camera, so she's looking down, and that made it easier for her to photograph people walking by her. Well, if anyone here, and we're in a photography school, has ever used a Roloflex, it's not a particularly easy camera. And the fact is, it's, it's a square formatted camera, so it doesn't have kind of the, the dynamics of a horizontal or a vertical camera. And you're always, you're, you have to track the opposite of what the ground glass is. So, uh, you know, and, and I should say that she wasn't skulking around. She was planting herself in the middle of intersections. She was standing there, 
And, 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 um, and so there wasn't this kind of clandestine photography, spy camera, things like that. But it is easy to focus, and you brought up focus earlier. That's one of the easiest cameras. To well, focus. it is easy to focus, and she knew exactly how far sh people should be when they were perfectly in focus. So, so I'll give it to her there. But yes? And it's also the Western Prince. I don't know if they're photographing or what that is, as opposed to going up and spending hours and hours. Well, right, you, you can know, almost look like a monster with a camera in front of you. I, I agree with you in some sense, but you are standing there, you're, you're, you're looking down, you've got a big black box. I mean, it's not like you're invisible. It depends on your vision. Pardon me, yes, yes, okay, oh yes. Do um, you have any sense how often she saw some of your prints, given that it was expensive? Okay, Vivian had a dark room in Highland Park. She did, in a washroom, in a bathroom. She did some prints, she was not a great printer. Um, so, you know, the taking of the picture was the most important thing to her. Remember in those days, and it's really important to remember this, every time Vivian clicked the shutter, it cost her a very middle income, I mean, she was a domestic, one dollar. That's how much you used to. By the time you bought film for four dollars, you process film for five dollars, and you, you make prints, it's a couple dollars. Every time she's pressing that shutter, it's a dollar. And that's a dollar in 1962 terms. So it's really the equivalent of three or five dollars now. So if you remember in those days, like we've got to take it back, clicking the shutter was a big deal. When we used to go on trips, if you came back with two rolls of film, you were like overdoing it. <laughs> and you really didn't take pictures, you didn't go on the street and take pictures of people walking by you. You didn't pay, take pictures of the servicemen who came to your house, it was always a special occasion. It was a wedding, a bar mitzvah, a graduation, a trip. So she was taking pictures that no one was even thinking about taking pictures but that's, of. But the real interesting thing about that question is, is that aside from pictures that she had developed and printed in the early 1950s, she almost totally abandoned printing pictures right. post, say, 1960, 1962. There's maybe five or 6,000 existing prints. Almost every one of those is, is from the 1950s. And then, of course, you've heard these stories about undeveloped film. Not only was Vivian not interested in sharing her pictures, printing her pictures, in some cases, she wasn't even interested in developing this film. And that's the key to understanding her, because it's really about the act of taking a picture, about the act of creating these relationships between her and people b between the camera. This is a woman who, as Rich said, she would come into their store and people would immediately just head for the back room because they didn't want to deal with her. She just couldn't relate to people. Yet the magic happened between her and the camera. And that's, that's what's fascinating. She left behind thousands of rolls of film that she obviously loved enough to bring these, drag these around from family to family, storage unit to storage unit. It meant a lot to her. She wasn't just taking these pictures and discarding them. But she didn't have to share them, she didn't have to print them, it was just that she had to keep them, to right. capture them. It was those moments. And, I would, and, he, and this is really a very important part of the mystery. She had no friends. We actually talked to one person who was a friend of hers, and he said, Vivian wouldn't want me to talk to you. <laughs> so he didn't talk to us. She had no friends, but here she's creating these remarkably intimate pictures of people. She's having these relationships with people that last, admittedly, short, a 60th of a second. Yes? I'm curious about what you just said, that she doesn't have relationships with people, but yet she's a nanny who has to create relationships with children, and so there's some, there's some relationship there between her subjects and this intimate relationship with she, she, yes, and those, those, those early nanny relationships were real and lasting. The kids who had her after the Ginsburgs they were kind of scarred by her oftentimes. First, first, first off, she would go on adventures with them. I'll give you a good, good, good example. You, someone asked about cameras, and we should mention that Vivian also took movies throughout her life. And the movies are terrible. You have to really have a barf bag if you want to watch them. They're just like shaky and you know, just very unskilled. But um, she went with, uh, with a, uh, one of her charges, a five-year-old girl, to the um, international to, to the stockyards. You know, remember Union Stockyards, Chicago had a stockyards. It was torn down in 1969, and she went there just before it was torn down. And, um, and she'd always tell her kids when they went on adventures, don't tell your parents about this. <laughs> so, so that didn't make for long-lasting relationships with parents. 
But um, this little girl um, tells me the story about how they got to the stockyards and she remembers dead sheep bleeding. And then she remembers, this little girl remembers walking up to the pens and petting the sheep as they were led into the slaughterhouses. And I thought it was a really fanciful, wonderful little story that probably you know, didn't really have much meaning until I saw Vivian's movies. And here's the dead sheep, and here's little Inger petting the, 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 the sheep as they go into the bins. So life with Vivian was very much an adventure. Yeah. This is this oh, is no no no. This is the real fascinating question because speak, speak, speak up, speak up, speak up. The question is, how did she yeah. nail all these great pictures? Well, how did she do this? How did yeah. she accomplish this? And for any photographer here, you know, if if you're given an assignment, you're going to go out and get it, and you're going to stay there until you get it, and you're going to bracket it. You're going to take extra pictures to make sure that you've gotten it. You're going to take a little lighter, a little darker. When you look at her contact sheets, almost always she's just taking one picture. And if she sees something really special or something when you look at it as a photo editor, you'd say, God, I can't believe this is, a, this is something big. This is the riots on the west side after Martin Luther King was killed. She's going to get it right. But she would just take one picture. And inevitably, it was always perfectly in focus, perfectly exposed, not shaky, not jiggly. And it's, it's remarkable, and I can't explain it, but it really is true. And we did, we've got a couple of context sheets yeah. here that we so, can show you later. And just co co contrast that with Gary Winogrand. You guys know Gary Winogrand did very similar things. He would stand in the middle of the street. The difference is he took thousands of pictures. He would take hundreds, hundreds of pictures every time he went out. And it really wasn't about his clicking the camera. It was about the power of photography, that if you just stand in the passing yeah. parade, and that's not to put down Gary Winogrand. I love him. Um, you, you, your camera will do great work. But th Vivian didn't shoot like that. Yes. yes. Oh, uh, uh, I'll get to it as soon as they ask one last question. How do you think her anonymity contributed to her work? I think she shot just for herself. She had no editor. She had no galleries uh, looking at her work. And so all she cared about was what she, th what she wanted to do. I mean, if, if she had become well-known. She would have been ruined, yeah. It would absolutely have been, because all of a sudden people would say, look, there's Vivian Meyer, let's walk down the street and get photographed, you know, so it would, have been, it would have been very difficult. So let me, I'll ask this, this question then, yes. Well, she took about one roll a day in her life. You know, I mean, every day of her life, her professional life from 1952 to 1976, because those, those are the pictures we have. We don't know whether she took pictures after that. We, you know, they could have been in another storage bin, uh, but the pictures that we saw, she took about one roll of film a, a, a day. Yes? Do you know if she ever had any training or who taught her or how she worked? We don't know. Uh, we'll talk about it in a second, what we're going to show you pictures. So let's go on a little bit, and then we'll, and then we'll talk. So, so the idea of putting together this book was to uh, figure out who, to bring Vivian Meyer out of the shadows. So here's the big secret about our book. When we got done a year of work, 30 people we saw, we went to France, we talked to people. Um, I said to Michael, you know, she's still in the shadows. And you know, there's those moments as a quote biographer, I wouldn't call myself a biographer, but let's, let's do it for right now. Um, we thought we failed, but the truth of it was is it would have been sad had we really brought her out of the shadows. And, and frankly, I don't want to get into this, but who can bring anyone out of the shadows? Do you, you know, we're all in the shadows, even, even personally. But Vivian was most difficult to bring out of the shadows. So to, to, to figure out who she was, we first depended on um, census records. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, she was born in 1928 in, in uh, Manhattan. And this is the 1930 census at the bottom showing her father her mother and Vivian, oh, this might be 1940. It's 40, yeah. Yeah, and the 1940 census came out weeks before our book, and it was so exciting because it wasn't indexed, and everyone was looking through all of Manhattan, and we found that she, had, that she was back together with her mother and her father. Uh, so we do have census records. We have lots of ship records of when she went to France. Her mother was born in France, and in 1932, her mother brought her back to France. So let's, let's show it. And this is the valley that she grew up in. Uh, it's in the Alps, the Southern Alps. Um, and Jeff and I had a chance to go 
to go here as biographers. We thought it was really essential to, to go and see where she grew up. And we figured, well, who's going to be there? She's, she's 83 years old. The people who want to be in their 80s. And uh, uh, probably nobody will be there. Well, we were, we, were, we were besieged by people who knew her and was interested in her. This is a man. Uh, we were taken around this, this valley, the Shamsur Valley, by three people. One spoke English, one spoke a little bit of English, and this man right here spoke absolutely no English. But he has spent the last two or three years going through all of the pictures that Jeff Goldstein sent to him so he could track down every one that she photographed and every place that she photographed. And, um, oh no, let's go back. This is a good, good one. You have 10 minutes. Uh, We've got you know 10 that. minutes, that's fine. Okay. So, so I'm with him, he stops the car, he takes out this book, he shows me this, 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 this house that's very similar, but not really exact as the house, but, it, but, he, but his, in, in the translation, they explained that he had gone through the building records, and they saw the remodelings, and this was definitely a house that Vivian had taken. So I said to him, through my translator, how did you find this house? It's changed so much. And he said the only two English words that he knew, Google Maps. <laughs> He had literally found it through the, through, through the mountains. These are the people that, we were, that were waiting for us when we arrived an hour late. There were about 40 or 50 once kids, now in their 70s and 80s. Vivian had photographed them on playgrounds in 1949. Okay, post-World War II France, 1949, there's not a lot of photographers going around and taking pictures. So when they got these pictures from Jeff, they identified everybody in the pictures, mm -hmm. and they all told us these were the only pictures that they had of their youth. Wow. And this really speaks about Vivian and photography, because the pictures are beautiful. They're not, they're not a kind of a mature Vivian, but how important they were to this, to this little valley that really prides itself. Uh, she was there from 1932 to 1938. We met about 15 people who remember her very well. The blonde American who spent a lot of time with her mother because she couldn't speak French at the time. Uh, this man was photographed in 1959. This is a picture of 1959. And this is him uh, the year that we went. This was 2011. Mm -hmm. And let's go back one one. I want to tell you, so we had this unique opportunity to be this little town in France, and everyone was opening their houses to us. So there were only three things that we saw on the walls of these people. This little rural, these little rural French houses. Can you guess what the three things were on their austere walls? A cross, very good. Anyway. You know, a calendar I would accept. It was usually a calendar with a map of France. So it was either a map of France or a French calendar. The third one's much more difficult. No, a huge flat screen Sony TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we only have about 10 minutes left. So I want, for those people who are really have inside Vivian Mark questions, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what our process was to put the book together. Because we feel really privileged that Jeff gave us access to his collection. So this is what it is. These are the prints that you've heard about. There's about 5,000 prints. As you can see, they're what most people would describe as snapshots. During her life, she didn't print up big exhibition prints like you'd see on the museum wall. She never did that. All of her prints were just small pictures like these that you would get from a photo finisher. The majority of her work was like this. It's just negatives, like in like old Walgreens photo finishing sleeves. She didn't archive it. She didn't put it in acid-free plastic. She just kept it in those, those little sleeves. Sometimes they were in glassine sleeves and then just packed like a brick in a box. Sometimes they had years, sometimes they had places, uh, but for the most part, it was what you would consider to be an unarchived collection. And she often marked them in French. And it was really interesting. I don't know how many of you remember this, but when you used to send your photos to the photo finisher, once in a while you'd get back these little sheets of what you did wrong. Do you remember those? Those little sheets? It would be really nice if you held up number three, camera straight. <laughs> Vivian did get those notes and she kept them. <laughs> so Jeff really went through this ambitious project of digitizing his entire collection. So what we were given was a terabyte, this little computer hard drive with essentially 20,000 pictures on it. 
And I can tell you when you're staring at this, it doesn't make a lot of sense because there's a lot of pictures, a lot of them don't have connections, it doesn't really kind of tell a story. So the key for us in doing this book was to put these pictures in the order, by roll, in the order they were taken. And like magic, that's where the story was revealed. This is essentially a digital virtual contact sheet. It begins in the top left and then it moves to the right. And this is what you were, we were telling you about. This is a nanny photographer. This is not a professional photographer. She's dropping the kids off at the bus stop. She gets on a train and she heads down to Chicago and starts to shoot. So as we were going through all of these images, this is what the story revealed. This was not Ansel Adams or Edward Western who was a professional photographer. She had that skill, but this was a nanny who was a photographer. And she wasn't out on assignments taking pictures for people in magazines or newspapers. Her beat was her life. And that's kind of what our book is about. She was a photo diarist. She was uh, a photographer who's the subject of her, of, her, of her work was her life. So in all these pictures that you see edited, particularly in the monographs, those great pictures are being pulled from these kind of mini stories. So if there's three collections now out there, if you were to put all these collections together, from beginning to end, you would have an unbroken story of her life every day, what she saw. Has anyone done that? Has anyone put uh, three collections together? They, they haven't. The, the, the three collectors, uh, they're, not, they're not raging mad at each other, but they haven't really cooperated together to do anything. But we hope that will happen in the near future. But I think that's, that's, I guess that's the takeaway from what we learned is that this is a woman, when you look at her work, you need to look at it in the context of what she was doing, that she was as dedicated as any of the greatest photographers of the 20th century and as skilled as any of those greatest photographers, but she devoted it to the documentation of her life. So this is pictures of kids going to the doctor's office, kids getting examined at the grocery store. All of the great photos that you see from her were just within the rhythm of her life. And she really didn't pay any more attention to the big moments that she experienced that kind of intersected with history sometimes than she did in the most mundane moments. And I think in that way, this, you hear this, this idea about mindfulness today, about kind of being in the moment. This is a woman who was really in the moment. This was a woman who found beauty anywhere that she saw in a reflection through a shopping cart at a grocery store or out a train window. She gave the same kind of uh, importance to those pictures as she did really interesting or photogenic material otherwise. And I think that's kind of the, the thing that we learned from this book. It's stop and smell the roses. S you can find beauty absolutely anywhere. And she found it in the most odd and strange and unlikely places, but she found it and she was always looking for it. And, and look, look at this context strip very carefully. This has real meaning for you here because that picture on the bottom row, second picture, is in the gallery. Um, but this is her day. She's putting the kids on the bus. She's waiting for them to be on the bus. Many of her day pictures then show her on the train. This one doesn't. And she arrives downtown. Frank Sinatra's movie, Come Below Your Horn, is at the Woods Theater. And she's just photographing downtown Chicago. I think that these are, and I don't want to put them down in any ways, these are small moments. These are not these epic uh, Iwo Jima pictures or even Henry Cartier-Bresson jumping over a, a, a puddle. These are really tiny moments that she was able to capture. And don't you feel like you've seen all this? I mean, if you, especially if you lived in Chicago, but it doesn't matter whether you've lived in Chicago. But we've, we've walked down the street. We've seen all this before, but she was able to capture it. Yeah, and I think that's, she was so ahead of her time in that way because today we have Instagram. Everybody's got cameras on their phones. They're, she, you know, if she was alive today, my God, in digital technology, she'd probably take a million pictures a day because she was finding beauty everywhere. Because she was so, you know, she still had to be somewhat selective. But in that way, she was very much ahead of her time. It's almost like she was blogging her life, she, but in this really beautiful and profound and artful way. And she was ahead of her time, but I think we've also caught up with her. Let's, let's go to the We next have room. like one we, minute, two minutes. Okay, two minutes? Okay. Well, do you want to just take questions for uh, those no, two let minutes? Me, let me let me no. Okay. Talk oh. to Ken, he's right over here. No, no, no I'm, I, I, we're gonna end in two minutes. Uh, let's ask, let, let's answer, yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Not, not, not a question, just something struck me when you just said about mindfulness and in the moment. I'm, I'm struck by, isn't that what we associated with childhood, the wonder that yes. every mm. moment is just a moment? And yeah, yeah. That's such a, an amazing quality of her 
almost like the child within constantly. Absolutely, that she had the uh, she had the attitude, but she also had this incredible talent right. to capture it. I'll just tell you what you're looking at we, here. We, we should just really briefly run through the picture. We'll show the picture, and we'll just we'll just do a uh, a ten second a ten second of each picture. Okay. Uh, this is go, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. So this is it. This is this is where she spent a lot of her time. This was a day at the beach. And we actually met somebody who recognized themselves in one of these pictures, and she described what it was like to watch her work. This is a really interesting point about her work. You gotta remember she was a nanny, so where she was employed, she both had to be there but not be there. She was living with somebody else's family, so she had this incredible ability to be there but not really be seen. And that's how she worked. That's how this happened up here, where she could glide through this scene and capture these moments without people being you know, kind of mugging for the camera, so not being sad. seen. So she had this incredible I'm ability and talent to capture these moments and just not have the picture be affected by it. Are we being thrown out? No, no, we'll, do, we'll go through a couple more. We'll, so we can go past the first guy. So these are the early photographs, the earliest we've ever seen. This is 1949, she returns to France. Um, the, she's using a brownie right. camera, so it has absolutely no control. Um, did she have training before that? I think it's a great question. This is not a beginner's type of photography in any way, but we haven't found, the, the 40s are still very much a mystery. And the interesting thing about these pictures is you look at them, look at, the hardest thing to do for a photographer when they're starting out is to go right up to somebody and get in their face and capture a moment. And that's what she's got here. She's not afraid at all. She's not in any way inhibited, which is very unusual, too, for a woman at that time, to go up to strangers Absolutely. and feel comfortable and to have them feel comfortable with you. Now, interestingly, we had a Vivian Meyer show in Paris. They loved her work. They had absolutely no interest in the pictures of France. <laughs> they just wanted to see America. This, Vivian is oftentimes described as a street photographer, but what I think our book really talks about is it went well beyond the street. This is just her kitchen in Highland Park. And this really is the type of picture that makes up a big part of her work. It's just, this is just the house that she worked and she'd washed the dishes and there's apples ripening on the, on the, on the windowsill. And she, again, she was just always aware of beauty, that beauty could be anywhere. A walk through just, just a, a, this a ginkgo, ginkgo leaves on the sidewalk in front of her house. And that's the thing about these pictures, it's important. These are not posed pictures, these are not pictures that she took time to light and these aren't actors, that she was able to find these kind of heavily, almost dramatic moments just in the flow of everyday life. I think most photographers, this, this violates every single rule of photography. You know, we've, we've, we've got the action going out on the side, we've got nothing in the middle, but somehow she makes it work. Uh, she photographed everyone in town, and she was quite the character. Everyone remembers her, uh, who lived in Wilmette in Highland Park, as this woman who walked very s ramrod straight and walked quickly with the kids at her hands, but she always stopped and took pictures of people. They called her the bird lady. That was her nickname. Again, this is downtown Wilmette. And, and we should go back to that one for a second, because after she took that picture, she turned the camera around, and she took a picture of what the dog was looking at, the sky, and it's really it's beautiful, too. Again, these little dramatic moments that a, that a nanny would have access to. This was the grocery store down the street from her, and she, she just had this ability to see these little things being played out and to capture that exact moment. Needless to say, this will never happen again. People will never stand in front of a mom holding their unruly child and, and not say, what are you doing, and get that camera out of here. These are pictures. Uh, she did fancy herself a little bit as a, uh, as a journalist, a real journalist, and, uh, and, and she, she, the 1968 Martin Luther King riots in April of 1968, unlike most journalists, she arrives on the Madison Street bus. And so these are pictures all from the bus window, and then she gets out and takes some very beautiful pictures of the riot scene. This is a beautiful picture. She was really interested in all the events of 1968. This is part of the show. And she, there's like a little chronology that she took. She was interested in Bobby Kennedy. She kind of documented newspaper headlines that kind of charted his rise as he started getting more uh, higher in the polls. After he was killed, she went out on the street. She took pictures of people reading the newspaper, of people who put up little memorials and windows. And this is one that she created on her own. She took the newspaper headline that says Bobby dies, and put it underneath this beautiful light coming through the window. And she would often do this with, with newspapers. She had a real affection for newspapers. 
We kind of have this theory, because you can see a lot of them, that she tried to capture the energy of the day. And during this time, a lot of that energy kind of was captured in newspaper headlines, these big, bold headlines. So in this kind of photo diary of her life, events that didn't happen anywhere near her were kind of charted. So again, if you put this all kind of together, you would see all of these events in history going by uh, every once in a while in these rolls of film. You'd always, it was always very easy for us to date these pictures yeah. because she often took pictures of I newspapers. So all you had to do was zoom in real close and you could get the date from them. So this was a theme that you saw throughout her career. We got two more. So there's pictures upstairs of the 1968 convention, and they're, they're very different than the type of convention pictures that we see, the night scenes of the police and the hippies fighting each other. She would go during the day. We'll show one last picture. And this is a picture of, uh, so little Inger, who I talked to you about before, remembers going on all these adventures with, with, uh, with Vivian. This was the one with the soldiers and their bayonets, or their rifles, that she said, can we go home now?